What's up, everybody? Ricky Kruth here. Welcome back to the Zero to Diamond show. I'm Ricky Kruth, as always, and today we're with Peter Lorimer. How you doing, Peter? I'm very good. How are you, mate? Good Absolutely. to see you, Ricky. Yeah. What, for sure, what, for sure. What, so, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, man, just down here getting after it, like always. <laughs> I, I hear you. You're in Alabama, right? Yeah. Nice. Never been to Alabama. Always kind of wanted to go, but never made it. Check this out, man. We I'm right on the Alabama-Florida state line, right on the beach. And we got white sandy beaches, palm trees, million-dollar condos. Love it. Sounds beautiful. Is that the yeah. Panhandle? Yeah, it is. It's right, it's right there at the end of the Florida Panhandle. It goes right into Alabama, probably like 30 miles. That's where I am. And then the Panhandle hits Mobile Bay. And uh, Mobile is a huge, has a huge bay. And then on the other side's Mobile. There's Dolphin Island, but the the really really nice beaches kind of start dwindling, and it goes into Mississippi, and it's not as nice over there. No disrespect to Mississippi at all, but they got good casinos, but their beaches aren't you know white sandy. You know. <laughs> and if you're listening in Mississippi, we still love you, and thank you for tuning in to the Ricky Kareem Show. <laughs> but yeah, man um so where are you la okay so you got a netflix show i got a netflix show yes so um it's that was kind of like the cherry on top of uh and it was actually believe it or not something that i wasn't really looking for yeah yeah i just kind of stumbled into it or we stumbled into each other um i uh was you can probably hear by my accent, I'm an English guy. I've been in California for 26 years. I came here with a, a dream and, a, and yeah. an airline ticket um, 26 years ago. But I used to be a, a, a record producer. I was a house music ooch, 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 uh, okay. record producer, and remixer. And I had uh, a lot of um, hit records through, through the 90s. I, I had over over 30 number ones in the Billboard Club charts in the US, 25 in the UK, wow. toured the world as a DJ. You know, it was a wild and wacky and wonderful time for about 18 years mm. that was incredibly rock and roll. Wow. And then, uh, and then around 2000, kind of saw the end of the music business coming. Uh, I'd been in it a long time. It was an unhealthy industry for me and I wanted to do something else. So I started property investing. Then I became an agent and then I became the number one agent in Keller Williams in LA. And then I started my own company and now we have four offices, uh, 175, nearly 200 agents. Um, and our big thing was social media. As a company, it was video and self-promotion and and Netflix literally found me on YouTube. Okay. So you're, so the, the foundation of your new company was social media. Correct. So back, going back to Keller Williams, becoming the number one agent, were you a single agent? Did you have a team? What were you? Single what agent. I've always been a single agent. What kind of volume, what kind of numbers do you have to do in California as a single agent to be the top agent? I think I can't remember what it was, but maybe it was 80 million or something. 80 million. Yeah. Maybe 90 million that year. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, I did it all through social media, no door knocking, no cold calling. No. So even back in the Keller William days, so this is 2003, four, no, 2005 is when I became an agent. So okay. I, I was the number one agent for Keller Williams. I got the award in either 2009 or 2010. I can't remember. Probably right. 2000. Yeah. I can't remember. One of those years. But we started PLG, which is PLG Estates in Beverly Hills. We started that in uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. And we're still going now. And it was in a, in a room not much bigger than this room. And now we're four offices and you know, lots of really cool people. And we went after a niche, you know, we went after a niche, Ricky. We, I wanted to go after my story is kind of always looking for the alternate route. And I didn't want to do, and I'm not knocking it, but I just didn't want to do the cold calling, the door knocking, the, 
the postcards, the usual stuff. So I wanted to really niche it down back then. So with me being a music guy, being a creative, I just went hard after the creatives of LA. I figured there was a lot of them and uh, went after my sphere and just was unstoppable. So you had a pretty big sphere before you got into real estate. I mean, you were investing, you had rock and roll. You had, you probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I knew a lot of folk, but yeah. I came to find out a lot of folk didn't necessarily trust me as a real estate guy when I got sure. my license. Yeah. And I, was, I found a lot of people, you know, I, in the music's an interesting game. It's full of glitter, but there's not a lot of money in it unless you're the super top end. So there was a lot of people who just were great, but couldn't, couldn't even jump into the property market. So I found my deals through digging into the darkest crevices and corners of my database and just not giving up. Right. So what would you say? So now that you've been through all that, you started your own company, you're founded on, you know, you guys as principals to build your business as social media and, you know, not the old fashioned way and all that good stuff. What would you tell somebody or how would somebody start from scratch? No real base. They're 20 years old. They just got their license. They, you know, what, what do, how do they, how do they become number one? So if I was going to move to Alabama, right? I don't know anybody in Alabama. If I was going to move to Mobile, Alabama. How big is the city? Well, I'm not in Mobile. I'm in Orange Beach. We got about 8,000 population, but we have about 6 million visitors every year. So let me deal with it because I can't even get my head around that. Let me deal with a city that I know, <laughs> say, say Chicago, right? If I was yeah. moving to Chicago, okay. here is what I would do as a brand new agent. I would chummy up with all of the agents in an office that I worked at. I would always recommend going to a boutique. That's just the way I operate. I, I, I think there was something that I learned in the music business when I was coming up through the ranks as a record producer. And, and somebody said to me, Pete, always stand next to the guy that's got everything to lose. And so with boutique firms, especially the, the more progressive ones, you get access to the owner of the company and you get access to someone who's got everything to lose if it fails. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with corporate. There isn't. My flavor is, has always been the mindset of being a boutique guy. Even though I was at Keller Williams, I ultimately started a boutique. So I would do that. I would cozy up with a bunch of agents who have, who have got listings in the area. I would ask them if I could set all their open houses. If they didn't have open houses free, I would say, can, in LA, we do them on Sundays. I would say, can I sit them on Saturdays? If they were not free on Saturdays, I'd say, can I hold them open Tuesday nights and Thursday nights? And then I would promote those open houses um, through social media and invite people to them. I would then prov promote myself in a specific zip code of Chicago, in an area of Chicago, let's say the South Side. I would promote myself as being an authority in that market. I would niche it down. Uh, I'm going to come up with an area. I'm going to call it Royal Woods, right? If there's a Royal Woods in Chicago, let me know. But I would go after the Royal Woods area and I would start doing videos about how to improve the value of your house in Royal Woods. New coffee shops that have opened in Royal Woods. Why is it great to buy in Royal Woods? And I would just keep hammering it and hammering it and hammering it and hammering it. I would go around to local businesses. I would introduce myself. I would say, do you mind if I do a promotional video about your business to the community? All I ask of you is, can I leave a little you know, notice of who I am, maybe some cards? And will you promise to put me out on your social media and I'll put you out on mine? And that's what I would do. And I wouldn't stop. And if I didn't have clients, I would be making videos constantly, 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 constantly. I like it, man. So, so you'd use the open houses as a reason to invite people to come meet you. Yep. I mean, and that would help you become familiar with properties and what they're priced at and what they look like and different subdivisions. And then, <clears throat> so you'd have two things. You do open houses, you'd promote those heavily, and then you do videos of local businesses. You get to know the business owners and you would kind of network like that. That's correct. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. And I would maybe, if the, I would look, I would see what, what's a new business. There's always a new coffee shop. There's always a new designer boutique, right? There's always a new mm -hmm. cheese shop or something. And I would say, hey, can I hold an event at your place? 
right? And they'd be like, well, what exactly is that? And I'd say, it's just a meet and greet. You just need to donate some cheese and some wine. You know, or maybe you bring the cheese, I'll bring the wine. I'm going to get a bunch of the local community in here. To, I'm going to promote your store. And then I'm going to sponsor, I'm going to say I'm sponsoring it. And all I'm doing is I'm bringing some wine. I'm bringing the people. And I just want to go around and meet everybody. Are you cool with that? Okay. And then, I, then I would get to know the locals and where they lived and blah, blah, blah. Right. And so, and so that's how you would get exposure. Okay. Now, now how would we go into taking that and creating, you know, clients out of that or or converting that into actual business that translate into us paying our bills so i would then if a bunch of people are rolling up to events i don't know what it's like in well in chicago but in la everybody wants to talk real estate all the time mm -hmm. so i would literally i wouldn't be practicing scripts and doing all of that stuff but mm -hmm. I would speak to people. I would ask them where they lived. I would say, why do you like it there? When did you buy your house? You know, do you know other people that want to move into the area? Very much the same techniques as open houses, but I would do it where, and I'm very good at getting people's numbers. I'm very good at getting people's details. And I'm like flypaper. Once you meet me, you're stuck. Right. You're never getting away. <laughs> done. I'm on you. Right. And then it's just follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up. I do not believe in Zillow. I do not believe in any online leads other than social media leads. So when you say you're like flypaper, you stay on them. What, do we, what are you doing? Are you calling them? Are you DMing them? Are you emailing them? Are you texting them? What are you, what are you doing to stay on them? All of the above. Everything. Everything. So when I was a new agent and I met someone, right, it's hard. It's hard because they meet a lot of people, right? When they think, and if they don't know you from Adam, you got a mountain to climb to win their trust. Right. Uh, and so I would do, this is back in the day uh, when I was prospecting before there were so many platforms in social media, but I would make sure that I called them and then I would email them and then I would text them to let them know I left a voicemail and an email. Just wanted to make sure, I'm not sure which platform you check. Just wanted to show you that I'm, you know, following up and uh, about what we talked about. By the way, a couple of new properties that are coming on the market that you might not know about yet. They're not on the market. Love to chat. Okay. And then reel them in. There you go. So, so we are making calls. They're just not cold calls. It's more like a follow-up call. Correct. It's a, it's a call to know, sort of know, might know, could know, just met. Yeah. Right. Never strangers. Okay. Now I know people that make a, a living, a handsome living through strangers. Mm -hmm. I would rather drive a bus. Sure. And and like you know, I'm a big component of everything works. You know, like yeah, your way sure. works. My way works. You know, everybody's way works. You just got to figure out what works for you. At the end of the day, it's about who's contact, who is coming in contact with the most people. And then who has the skills to communicate that they actually care about those people. And then on the back end, who's doing the best job to build their brand from there being that flypaper. I mean, that's just the bottom line. I don't care how you, who you're calling or what you're, I mean. Yeah, true. It's all the know, same. As long as you're. It's all, it's all the same. I guess I like to have a little bit of emotional leverage. Right. Right. You know, with a complete stranger, they can tell me, I go screw myself. Whereas if I met Ricky through Bob at the gym and I know Ricky and Bob are good mates and I'm, I'm kind of okay mates with Bob. And then I take you out. The chances of you screw me over cold because you know, I know Bob have been reduced. Right. And that's, I like it. You know, I like that. I think, I think a lot of people watching are actually it's probably like a lot of things. A lot of light bulbs are probably going off of, they're probably thinking to people right now, that, that i they, can't understand that guy he's got such a strong accent they're probably thinking <laughs> what the hell did he just say <laughs> i like his glasses but i don't understand <laughs> a word he's saying you guys should have seen him before he came on man he had these headphones on that were like this big yeah these i look like i'm flying a plane <laughs> more calling awesome <laughs> so okay <clears throat> how uh how big is your company how many agents about 175, between 150 and 200. 
Okay, and y'all are over just right in the California, LA area, just a few offices. We're all in LA. We're in the four. We're in the four, kind of the four central areas of LA. You've got Beverly Hills. You've got in between Beverly Hills and downtown. There's an area called Los Feliz. You've got uh, um, Studio City, Toluca Lake, which is the valley, the New Jersey of LA. And then you've got um, I got a beach office, PLG Sand. Great. Sounds like you're doing really well. So has the market kind of over the last 18 months or so kind of eh, flattened yeah. out a little bit, kind of, you know, leveled off uh, days in the market up, inventory up, prices flattening out, stuff of that nature? For sure. Oh, now, yeah. This is a moment that I've been waiting for. So yeah, I, don't, me too. I don't know if you've seen that movie, The 300. You seen it? Oh, yeah. Great movie. So oh, we, are the, we are the 300. Yeah. Okay. Because and Compass and you know Coldwell and Keller are the army, right? Okay. And then what has happened is, as a little bit of opaqueness and confusion has entered the market, we all have our swords out and we're banging our shields because this is the moment we've been waiting for. Yeah. I now like we're where gonna, this is going, dude. Now we are going to charge. And, 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 and spear as many people as we possibly can, figuratively, of course, just using the 300 metaphor. Yeah. Uh, because there's an awful lot of money being thrown at, at the real estate industry. Yeah. Now, it's going down a dark, deep hole, though. Well, this is it. It's easy when the plane's doing this. Ooh. Right. Winning. Oh, look at these apps. Look at this shiny. Yeah, they're losing money on the way up. They're losing money on the way up. I mean, what's going to happen when it really? <laughs> if you can't make money when the market's great, what do you think is going to happen when the market turns? Yeah, that's that's it. That's good. And I just think those of us and those companies that have my entire strategy for the past. So I first detected, I sell a reasonable amount. I used to sell a lot more, but I sell a reasonable amount of luxury, right? And around four years ago, four years, one of my, one of the, I don't have a lot of talents, but one of the talents I do have is I can see around corners, right? Always been able to do it. Even when I was in the music business, I had to predict where dance floors would be 18 months from that date. So I'd make an album and it had to be current and this is electronic music, which changes like that. So I had to estimate where it was going to land. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in business. And that muscle I never thought would help me in real estate. But it's turned out to be the best muscle I could possibly hope for. And so the ability to kind of have a really clear idea or an 85% clear idea of where this is all going allows us and me as a company to position ourselves where it's going to be, not where it is or where we think it's going to go, but be there when it arrives. Uh -huh. And four years ago, I began to detect faint, like almost with my ear to the ground, the feeling that the super high end was contracting, beginning to contract. And I then was like, okay, I need to, as, as the rest of the world was having you know these expensive lunches and glamorous affairs and big parties and da 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 da, da. i was making uh plans in preparation for the contraction so i moved the ethos of my company about two years ago to prepare for the contraction so that i'm not looking at, at like bills coming in and this and that so that when everybody else is beginning to lose their heads, we will keep ours. And we are more focused today than we have ever been. And it's an exciting time. Absolutely. So you went through the last crash. Yep. You said you got in in 05 and then you started your company in 10, which was literally the bottom of the, uh, of the crash. Yep. So what, what, so tell me what you learned through that, that is, and, and what actions are you taking now to position yourself to where you don't lose your head and you can continue? So what I learned was, and, and again, I think I have to thank the music business for this, Ricky. What I learned is when a, a genre in music changed, right? If it went from techno to trance, a lot of guys that were doing techno were like, 
Oh, I don't really know what trance is. What the hell do I do? Nah, I'm just going to stick doing tr- techno, mate. I'm just going to do techno. Right. So evolving and adaptation is part of business. Mm-hmm. So in 2007, I remember going into my office manager at Keller Williams because I heard one of the guys in the office say he'd just sold his hairdresser, his third investment property. And I was like, okay. And I said, where's this hairdresser? He said, oh, it's just a local guy down the block. And, I'm, and it just didn't compute. Um, so I'm like, all of these people are leveraging themselves. What happens if they walk away? What happens if there's an economic shift? And I spoke to my office manager and she looked at me, bless her heart, she was very nice. But I said, I, her name was Lisa. I said, Lisa, what happens? What happens if we go to war with someone and there's an economic shift and everybody's got 100% loans? In fact, what year, like, what year is this? 2007. Seven, yeah. And she looked at me and she said, oh, well, that will never happen. This is America. We, we will just keep going up. And I was like, okay. As soon as I heard those words, I'm like, if this is what everybody's thinking, this shit's going down. That's what everybody so, was thinking. Yeah. So just on gut, that gut that I've trusted my entire life, that gut that I left home at, fi- dropped out of high school, left home at 15 to go make house records in London. I followed my gut. My gut said, Pete, you need to have a differentiator. You're a new agent in this industry. You're meeting investors. You need to get, kind of do something to stand out. Now, my, mate, my mind was, I can't get you all the way there, but I can get you 80% of the way there that this doesn't make sense. So I had a bunch of investors who looked at me like a rookie agent. And I was just bold as brass. And I said, fellas, keep your money in your pockets. Because I don't think this is going to last. It can't just keep going up and up and up and up and up. And this is when it was 6% mortgages. I said, I think something's going to happen. And a couple of them, not all, a couple of them listened. And then the crash came and I was like, oh, shit, I was right. Uh, And it was as much like, wow, that was lucky. Um, And then these investors came back and, and then a bunch of them gave me a whole gang load of money. And I went out shopping to buy investment properties in the downturn. But the point I'm making to give you a very long answer is how does one prepare? One prepares by keeping our eyes really wide open and not being resistant to change. It is apparent the market is changing. Most mm-hmm. people don't like change. I love change. Most people don't like it. If we resist and put our heads in the sand and go, it'll be okay. I'm just going to keep doing what I was doing a year ago because that worked. You're going to go down. You'll go down. If we evolve and look at the, because this isn't, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy. I just look at what's coming down the pike. And if the messages are markets flattening, sales are taking longer, prices are not going up as much, maybe they're coming down. I can resist all I want and it's not going to change it. So now what I did in 2010 was I went after investors. And in 2019, I'm already lining people up to say there's going to be an opportunity for mom and pop investors to pick up single family residences in Los Angeles. And many of them have already started buying. And I think there's going to be more opportunities next year. And uh, you just got to bob and weave with the punches, right? Got it. Got it. So your strategy is... When you foresee it coming, you're trying to just kind of advise clients that there may be something coming. I want you to be aware. Give me your contact information. I'll stay in touch with you. And when this, when this, when these opportunities come and the market folds a little, I'll call you and we'll do some business. So that's, that's your way of preparing. So, so you've got, so I'm taking it that you've got your business of normal people, regular people who who have to buy, have to sell now for whatever reasons. That's normal yep. business is just kind of clicking along. But then in the back of your mind, you're also not, you're also paying attention to the fact that we may have something on the horizon and you want to go ahead and start kind of getting the word out that you're going to be the guy to come to if and when that happens. Yes. And it doesn't always have to be catastrophic events, right? Sure. It can be stuff like 
you know, rate increases. It can be, there is a, a new thing in Los Angeles where there are development zones, right? Nobody really knows what they are. Development zones are where you can sell, uh, buy a property, hold it for 10 years and not pay any tax on it as an investor. I'm sure okay. you've got them in Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are other things in LA, uh, accessory dwelling units, right? Where real estate agents are kind of scratching their heads going, well, I think I know what it is, but there's an opportunity to know that stuff now so that you can add value to your people so that they trust you. Because if everybody's receiving the information at the same time you are, where's your value add? Right. You know, I'm one of the things I live by Ricky is I would much rather act in a market than react. Uh I'd much rather set up my stall and say, this is what I believe rather than, oh, have you heard? Right. You know what I mean? I do. I do to a certain extent. I think, I think you can set the expectations and say, but you're not saying that this is what's going to happen. You're saying this is what, this is kind of what might happen. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you can't, I want to make that clear. I mean, you can't, nobody can predict it. Nobody knows. Um, You know, the moment that you say, you know, what's going to happen, you know, you're setting yourself up for somebody to look at you crazy when it does or when it doesn't happen. Um, You might even put your clients in a bad position because they might make a decision based on what you say. So you're not predicting the market. You're telling people that based on your experience, that you believe that this is what might happen. And if it does, you know. Yeah, I mean, case in point is this, right? So rates, as we know, are crushingly, crushingly low. Crushingly. Right. right. So I've had, when I say investors, these are not the, the, the investors that have no pulse and just count money. These are mom and pop people, right? Real people who've got real money to lose. Um, I'm a real emotional guy, so I really like working with emotional people. Um, and they're saying, Pete, should we wait until, you know, isn't there going to be a correction? I think there is going to be a correction, right? And I think it's already underway. The correction's already happening. The question is, and they're saying, should we wait or should we buy now? When rates are at three and a quarter percent, the market would have to correct an awful lot for that to not make sense. Because I believe 18 months from now, that three and a quarter percent is going to be closer to five. Uh huh. And so that means the difference between three and, and three and a quarter or three and a half percent and five percent is over 20 percent. So that means the market would have to contract by 20 percent for it not to make sense to buy now. That makes right. sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's what I believe, you know, I, and the, the, the bottom line, Ricky, is this with all clients, treat them like family, mm-hmm. treat them like you, like you are my own brother, David. And you, how I want him to win and I want to advise him to buy or to wait or to sell next year or to sell now. Or if you don't need to sell for, if you, if you need to, if you want to move between one and five years, then hold on to the house. Let's talk again in four years when all the madness is over. Let's talk then. You know, nobody knows where it's going to be in four years, but we're heading into a year next year that I think is going to be turbulent. Right. You know what you just said right there for the past 60 seconds is the foundation of my coaching program. Talk to them like they're your mom, dad, brother, cousin, right? Take a mental snapshot next time you're talking to your mom or dad or best friend from high school, like pay attention during that conversation and realize your body language, the tone of your voice, uh, you know, the speed of your voice, everything, how comfortable they are with you, how comfortable you are with them, the whole nine yards and start to try to um you know imitate that exact moment with your clients that's something i'm really big on because it's got to be like an extended part of your family where you don't care if they buy or sell you just want to help them either way now later tomorrow never whatever some of my best clients never even bought anything from me or sold anything with me They, they they've referred so many people to me but they've never bought or sold anything with me but I treated them so well when I showed them property or went to the listing appointment or whatever it was, but they never did anything. But they, they see me as like their little nephew or their uncle or their, you know sure. what I mean? And I got people like that too. I mean, we're getting into something that I really, really, really believe in, which is the core of my business, which is with, with clients, there is commission and then, and then there is service. This catches a cab, goes to the train station, gets as far away from me as possible. 
when I'm thinking about commissions, I'm not thinking about service, mm. right? So commissions, I don't even think about. I think about what can I add to this relationship, right? Okay. Whether it be, whether it be, I get money from it or not. What can I add? When I was a brand new agent, somebody was even thinking about real estate, right? And they had no job and no credit. I would be like, let's get in the car. I would buy them a coffee. I'd buy them lunch. I'd give them a good day out. And I'd say, I hope you enjoyed yourself. So when you're ready, I'd love to help you. The amount of folks that came back to me a year or two later after they built their credit up and bought with me was staggering. The number, there, there are, okay, we're getting into the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Ricky, if that's all right. There are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, dude, that will kill business. Okay. All right. Number right one. Down. Go ahead. What are they? <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the hell they are. Okay. So I just did a freaking podcast on this as well. Oh, God, what are they? You know what? I'm just four gonna... of them, man. You have to at least remember one of the four, right? Well, I remember all. <laughs> I remember some of the big ones, right? So, essentially, the 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 the, the ringleader of the four horsemen of the apocalypse: mm. expectations. Okay. If we are going into relationships with expectations, it is a disaster. That doesn't mean goals. That doesn't mean we we don't hope to close a house or make a sale. But okay. when I go on a listing appointment, I'm looking how I can be of service to that person, even if it's to say, you know, I'm not the right man for the job. Mm -hmm. You need to sell it with Ricky because Ricky's just got far more experience with this type of thing. I'm just not the right guy. Or now might not be the best time for you to sell at all. Might not. The you, know the time, you know how many times I've done that and won that listing either right then or a week or two later? Because yeah. I literally did not care. I would, I would say, you know what? I think you need to wait a little bit and just but based on your situation of why you want to sell. Yeah, I mean, I'm big on finding out what people's motivations are behind why they want to buy or sell. Yeah, me too. Me too. And the amount of listings that I've gone on and I've said to them, you know what? Why are you selling? Why don't you keep the house? Yeah. Pull, it, pull out the equity. Go buy another house and then rent this sucker out. You're in a great area. You're in a great school district. This house is going to double in the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. Keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it. Okay. Expectations are one. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what the other four are. I might have to dial up my own hey. bloody channel. All right. You're going to have to email me that. I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, cool. Well, tell me about the Netflix show. What is it? What's it about? So, it? Uh, yeah, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Got it. It was so great. The video was so great. But I just have completely spaced on what I said. You have to go to my YouTube channel, viewers, and find out. Um, so Netflix, the Netflix show is something that I'm, I'm a big believer in, which is uh, the business of Airbnb. So I'm a big believer in the shared economy. Uh, to put my money where my mouth is, one of the big changes I did with my own firm is we had multiple offices, traditional offices around L.A., and we had a 6,000 square foot headquarters in Beverly Hills. And the, the type of agents that I, we attract tend to be the more kind of savvy, the more kind of streetwise guys, mm. all of whom this is their office. Right. And so the only time my office was full was when we had meetings. So I uh, said to my lovely wife, who's my partner in the business, I said, look, we're, we're flying high right now. We're doing great. So I need to do something drastic. So I, sh I, I shut down my Beverly Hills. Head I didn't sh shut it down. I moved my Beverly Hills headquarters into WeWork. And then I moved my Valley office into WeWork. And then I opened a beach office in WeWork. And then I have a brick and mortar office in Los Feliz. Mm -hmm. And what that did is it was a bold move and it allowed us to um, essentially prepare for the storm that's coming that I referred to earlier, back to the Netflix show. So Airbnb is something, again, shared economy that I'm a big believer in, like we work as the shared economy. And um, I got approached by Netflix who found me and heard what I was saying about it. And they said, 
do you want to do a show on Netflix? And I was like, um, who is this? <laughs> I thought it was one of my pals goofing around. And I didn't think for, I'll be honest, Ricky, I didn't think for a second that I was going to get it. You know, I thought I'm just this big, rambunctious British guy that nobody can understand. And uh, they said they'd been auditioning for a while and couldn't find anybody. And I'm like, where were you looking? Prison? And right. um, that's where and they found you. That's where they found me in a cell <laughs> with, a, with a stripper and, you know, some fake money. <laughs> no, um, they, found, they found me and I, I was, you know, they were lovely and I essentially got the job pretty much. They so how long has it been going? So it came out last season one was last year. We okay. went to eight, eight cities in the US. Um, okay. and, and the premise of the show is, I guess I'm kind of the Gordon Ramsay of Airbnbs. Okay. I'll, go, I'll go to Airbnbs, figure out why they are not working as a business. Mm. And then Genevieve Gorda from Trading Spaces was the designer on the show. Mm. Her and I worked together to make the business and the design fabulous. Then we relaunched the properties and I'm happy to say they're all doing 100 to 400 percent better than they were uh, before we got to them, and uh, the show's been really good and opened a lot of doors for me. And uh, you know, there's going to be more TV coming next year. Absolutely. So when you when you go in there and and, and remodel these, and they start doing the 100 to 400 percent better on the rentals, is it a combination of is it just strictly we remodeled it and made it look this certain way and that's what is attracting more renters or is it a combination of we remodeled it it looks a million times better and we're advertising it differently correct it's that one so with with short-term rentals the philosophy is very similar to real estate except when somebody's buying a house the how the, the area is obviously really important and then and the house is really really important and then the facilities in the area are important as well, but not maybe as important as the house itself. Mm. In short-term rental, it's, the, it's kind of the other way. Right. The amenities, the restaurants, the bars, the, 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 the stuff that sightseeing is as important as the house. And so what we did on the show is completely rework the business plan, completely rework the marketing completely reworked like all the photography and videos and then the design so that it could be marketed for something that was a niche. For example, we did a boathouse in Seattle, right? There are lots of boathouses in Seattle or, uh, that are available for short-term rental. Um, so then how do you stand out? So we created one where we, because it was smaller, we called it the, um, the, the Seattle Lake Shore Love Nest or something. So we were going after a niche of romantics. And, and it did really, really, really well. I mean, one of the secrets for me of anything is don't try and appeal to everyone all the time. Just try and appeal to the people that like you all the time. Right, right. True in business as well, huh? You know? Yeah, yeah. 70% of people either won't like you, have another agent or whatever, but 20 to 30% of people you talk to are going to love you enough to do business with you now or later. Yep. Cool, man. Well, anything else that you want my audience or viewers to know? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm a very big proponent of, of, of video and vlogging. That's definitely the cornerstone of, of who I am and what I'm about. So I'm going to give your listeners uh, and viewers some uh, places to go find me. On Instagram, at Peter Lorimer. Mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube, Peter Lorimer Official. Facebook, Peter Lorimer Official. Uh, and then on YouTube... Uh, and on Instagram, I have a personal channel, which is Peter Lorimer Life and Times, which is my family vlogs and, you know, these big epic films that I do when I go away, which I totally utilize to push out to my sphere to catch a business, which it does. Absolutely. Yeah. I have Ashley, was it? Do what? Ashley, oh. was she the one emailing uh, me? Yeah, Ashley is. Uh, yeah, it's a dude. Oh, Okay. Ashley, have him have him uh, email me all those links, and I'll put those in the uh, under the description of this YouTube video, and also the podcast and everything. That way, everybody can find you there. But man, do you do one that? of these every day? No, I do maybe two of these a week. As far as people on my 
my show and then I'm probably on maybe three or four of other people's shows a week. So I probably, yeah, I probably do one or two. <laughs> like I'll do, I'll do another one after this and then I'll do two tomorrow, but I don't have anything the rest of the week. So it's just a hit or miss. I, people think I cram a lot in, dude. <laughs> people think I cram a lot. In. Hey, you got, you guys should think about coming to Orange Beach or Gulf Shores to do the, uh, do, do one of those Netflix shows. Cause we got 6 million visitors every year. It's a small town on the beach. There's a lot of Airbnbs and uh, we've had HGTV and other, pl other players down here. So it might be something interesting. Yeah. Anybody watching, if you've got an Airbnb, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll give you my email address, peter at peterlorimer.com. There you go. Easy. Easy peasy. Cool, man. Well, man, I know a lot of people got a lot out of this, so I appreciate you doing it and reaching out and everything. And My pleasure. Just uh, let me know if there's anything else I can do for you, brother. You got it, Ricky. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Later, guys. See you, mate.